morning, good afternoon, good evening. You all are having the pleasure of listening to me once again. I'm Vanessa Bass, HR Director for Queen Anne County Public Schools. This year, the Supreme Court has had a mandate based on court cases that involve some familiarity of cases you might know, the Boy Scouts of America and college campuses. Hence, there has been Title IX updates. The definition of sexual harassment, you all have this. I covered this. But this gives you some context on why we in the school system take sexual harassment very, very seriously. Many, many times, cases like this, financial ruination, as people would say, the Boy Scouts are still being sued. I am sure you have seen the commercials on television as I have saying if you think that you were abused or something of harm have come to you, please get your cases in immediately. Understand the definition of sexual harassment. Quick pro quo, we've heard that a lot in the last two years. That means if I do something, you'll do something for me or vice versa unwelcome reasonable person feels that they have been persuaded. Conduct of a uh, basis of sex that satisfies any of the following means sexual harassment. Quick pro pro, harassment by an employee. Unwelcome conduct that is reasonable person would find so severe, pervasive, objectionably offensive, that is denied a personal equal access to school education or a program. Sexual assault, as defined by the Clergy Act, dating violence, domestic violence, stalking, defined by violence against women, and these acts are not elevated for severity, persuasiveness, offensiveness, denial, educational access are all considered a depravity when it comes to equal access. This is a lot of words, meaning that you could either lose your job if you decide to engage in behavior that is not conducive to the learning environment or the work environment. School employees, that would be us, we must report incident, mandatory reporters. We are, by the nature of our job, mandatory reporters. All K-12 employees under Title IX means that you must report. And I'll say it two and three times. It does not mean that I don't know that I said it before. It just means it is a severe, severe case against us as employees if we do not report. That was also covered how you reported, who you reported to. Make sure you let your principals know, a guidance counselor. It, they will investigate it. It will then come to either Matt Evans, who is Director of Student Services, Supervisor of Student Services, or myself on the employee side. So an easy way to remember it, if it's an offense against a child, it will go to Mr. Evans. If it is an offense against an adult, it will come to me. All right, minimum response required and supportive measures. This is so serious that I usually can go off script but I don't go off script when it comes to a fine, and a huge fine, if we do not follow these directions as expressly stated in the Title IX updates. Schools must report it promptly in a manner that is not deliberately indifferent, which means clear, unreasonable in light of known circumstances. Take what you know, report it. And I want to say last year, I used to say, get it off of you. When you know something is occurring, make sure you get the people that's involved, get the names, the dates, as much information as you can to let the principal know. Most of you all will be in schools. You will be working with a school-based leader, principal, assistant principals. Most principals kind of like to know this information themselves firsthand. So... Please, once you do that, everything is confidential. You saw that in the other presentation. You are not to be afraid of reporting. 
Make sure you do. It might span out to be nothing. Absolutely nothing. But on the other hand, it could be really, really important that you report this immediately. Title IX coordinators must promptly contact the alleged victim. That would be myself again or Mr. Evans. Once we're notified by principals, then we start doing what we are assigned to do as Title IX coordinators, adult versus student. Uh, we will discuss your wishes for supportive measures. We're here for you. Does it mean that it'll be comfortable? It does not. Sexual harassment is never comfortable. It's embarrassing, it's hurtful, and it's a lifetime of working through whatever happened to you. It's a lifetime. We will work with you with counseling. If what the school system is not providing, many times they can work with a school psychologist. Because you have the counselor, you have school psychologists, and if need be, there are some other counselors within the system that could work with you. Or we will certainly find out who you're comfortable with. They are extensions of deadlines. As we go through, if something occurred and we can't get all the information, but most things need to be reported, investigated, and come up with a decision in a timely manner. Supportive measures are free of charge, non-disciplinary, non-punitive, non-retaliatory. Because people sometimes don't report things because they think they're going to be punished. In the world of work, they call it retaliation. You cannot, you cannot be punished for reporting something that is truly wrong. And it usually is something having to do with your person. Supportive measures are available to the respondent after the formal complaint is filed. So when you let us know that something is happening or has happened, we write the formal complaint because we have to do that. And then we will tell you of the things that are available to you. They can modify classes. This is really, really important because parents want to know. What will you do to protect my child? Principals can change schedules. They can provide school escorts. If it's something that occurred on the way to class and you're walking alone, they certainly can provide school escorts. Mutual restrictions. That's always interesting. Sometimes parents go get a restraining order and principals have to come with things like 600 feet apart. Well, if you're in the same class, then we gotta change schedules. 600 feet apart, mandated by the uh, law, you might can't eat in the same cafeteria. Now, I do know we're in the COVID area. We don't have that to worry about until we can conquer COVID. But however, any surrounding areas that you might be with the person you have filed a complaint against and we are under law by the restraining order, we will do many of these things. For adults, leaves of absences. If you feel like you're working in the same workspace with that person and you're an adult, you could possibly get a leave of absence. Now, mind you, most of these things will have to be approved by county or school leadership. It would go to the deputy, it would go to the superintendent, and then you could receive m many of these things depending on the severity of the case. Formal complaints triggers investigations. So that means if it's something that happens to anybody in this district, adult or student, Mr. Evans will be spending an incredible amount of time with students and I'll be spending an incredible amount of time with adults. Uh, the complaint is to be documented and filed by the complainant, parent or legal guardian. That's how it works. Or Title IX coordinator alleging sexual harassment and requesting an investigation. The school must investigate because they are the people that are close to the situation. They know the children, especially if you've been there 9 through 12 or you've been there 6 through 9. Yes, it occurs quite young. When filing, when filing a formal complaint, it triggers the school's oblig obligation. So it doesn't come here first, because if it comes here first, I will say, have you talked to your principal? I said in another talk, I can't remember at this point, I, I'm talking a lot, but principals do not like surprises. We don't like to find out things secondhand. 
it puts us behind the eight ball. We like to be out in front. And those of you all that have worked with me a while, I do not keep secrets and I do not like surprises. I have to let people know who know. Now, not keeping secrets still means it's confidential. Only who needs to know will know on a needs basis for sharing. Because if you ever feel like it's not confidential, then people will not tell whatever has happened to them that have made them uncomfortable. Many times you just recognize that the personality changes. The person is not who they used to be. Or the child is not who they used to be. So you must be trustworthy and you must keep someone's confidence. Conf their, their information confidential, excuse me. Um, if a complainant does not file a formal complaint, the wishes of the complainant should be respected unless Title IX coordinator decides to initiate the complaint and is not clearly reasonable in light of the circumstances. In other words, that's a lot of words, but if whatever happened to you is so egregious, even though you don't want it to be investigated, the system has to investigate it. The system must investigate it and also turn their filings into all parties necessary. And if we don't, many, many things could occur. It could end up in the Office of Civil Rights. Schools must ensure that parents and legal guardians are aware of their right to file a complaint on the behalf of their children. Sometimes children don't want anything reported, but parents demand that it be reported. A lot of words. Here are the criteria. Title IX sexual harassment complaints must be addressed through the prescribed grievance process. The process only requires if all the following criteria is met. At the time of the filing, the formal complaint, the complainant is participating and attempting to participate in an education program or activity of a school the formal complaint is filed with. So, a lot of words. That means if you're going to school every day and whatever has occurred to you has stopped you from participating, there's a problem. You need to file a complaint. If you're in college, you're, look, you're recognized as a young adult. However, whatever happened to you is keeping you from participating in your college program, which is stifling your movement towards your degree or your training. The conduct meets the new definition of sexual harassment. The conduct occurs in the United States. The conduct occurs school education program or activity. All right. So you're going to a football game. You're on the bus. It occurs on the bus. It's sexual harassment. If you get to the game and it's another school outside the county, but you're still wearing that school's uniform, something happens, it's still sexual harassment. So, you know, a lot of people think that if it doesn't happen on campus, or if it doesn't happen on school property, then you get away with it. You know, when I, when I was coming along, but kids used to want to fight at, on the grocery store parking lot because they weren't in as much trouble because they was off school campus. If you are on a school field trip, daily, overnight, uh, well, I, I we'll have to check into if you're on a school field trip and you're going abroad. It used to be the French club and the French classes would go to Canada. The Spanish people, Spanish speaking students in the Spanish class, they might go to Mexico. However, the way the United States and most countries are now being relatively safe with travel, we might not have that to worry about. But just understand, if you're representing or working for a school system, no matter where it is, and something unfortunate occurs that is connected with this entity, it's sexual harassment. Formal complaints of sexual harassment that do not meet all the criteria above must be dismissed under Title IX. So, it says, a school may dismiss a complaint if the complainant withdraws it in formal writing. So if, you, if your parents, because they're going to act as your legal um, agent, for lack of another word, 
So if they withdraw it, mutual agreement, then it's withdrawal, we can stop the investigation. Respondents is no longer enrolled as a student or employed as a school employee. Oh, that's flight. That's flight. Now, it does not take you out of the mix. It just means it could probably goes to another level. This school wouldn't have to investigate or the school system wouldn't have to investigate. But it does not mean what occurred didn't occur. It just means it moved. It moved. And in order to protect people from having to go through this again, see something, say something. We say that about everything. Suspicious packages, suspicious people. You have to say something to protect the next person. Schools must give written notice of the dismissal. So we would write a letter letting the parties know that we're no longer investigating. Based on a withdrawal, schools may address sexual harassment affecting students and employees that fall outside of Title IX jurisdiction in many ways that we can choose. Up to dismissal. Up to dismissal. You're probably going to lose your job. All right. This talks a little bit about the process. Written notice to both parties. Both parties are entitled to an advisor, advocate, investigations, they will occur. Emergency removal of students, that's one of the um, criteria that you can get some help. Class change, I think, I think it's listed differently, but it's the same thing. Class change, class escort. It could even mean a school change. Depending on the severity of whatever occurred, it could be a school change. I have not seen that under, under sexual harassment, but I have seen it with young people just can't get along and they fight all the time. I have seen that. So it still follows the same process. Hearing panel, the new rule permits, but does not, uh, it does not have to be in K-12 to build a hearing to adjudicate the Title IX matters after initial investigating is completed. In other words, you could kind of go to an appeals court. You know, there's another level. If the person is not satisfied with what the investigation says and the conclusion says, they could have another hearing panel. They certainly could. Timelines, administrators must interview parties, witnesses, collect all the evidence and a written report. And they tell us the timelines. And the timelines are based on when the incident occurs, how many days we get to um, do the written notice. Those are easy if you can find all the people. The investigation takes a little longer because you got to talk to everybody. Getting written statements, easy. People usually do it, drop it off, not a problem. But then it is a face-to-face -face interview to make sure what you wrote is the same thing that you remember a day later. And you see this. On TV, in lost shows, people sometimes, if they're not quite telling the truth, it's a different story every time you talk to them. So this is very time consuming. It's, it's very time consuming. And you get an appeal, and then it should not be any retaliation. If, if people find there's a retaliation, they won't see something say something. They just won't. I don't want to be involved. I didn't see anything. Yeah. Okay. That's a wrap.